So come follow me for this week is section 106, 107, and 108. There's a lot of fun stuff to learn in these. Uh, definitely well worth rereading again, going over 107 to, to learn more. Uh, in a way, you could say 107 really adds to the church handbook or the guidebook of how to do things. So a lot of principles that are taught in here that talk about how the organization of the church runs, the structure, how things come together, who's responsible for what. Uh, some really good insights and ideas, so well worth studying and learning. It's really, it's all about priesthood and priesthood authority is what uh, these chapters are talking about. So lots of fun things to learn that uh, can help us in understanding how Heavenly Father wants us to do things to further his work, to help people to have the gospel and uh, learn more. So uh, just a lot of fun stuff in here. 106 is not a huge section, neither is 108, but 107 is pretty big. There, there's a lot in there, that's for sure. Um, a couple of comments on here, because, uh, I, I mean, the, the we're talking about priesthood, okay? And when we talk about priesthood, it's important to realize that priesthood is the authority to act in the name of God, okay? And there's there's two parts to the priesthood. There is authorized use of the priesthood, and then there is holding an office in the priesthood. So those are two separate concepts that, that definitely work together, but they're two points or concepts that are important to understand individually. So there are offices in the priesthood, and they talk about this in, in these sections of courses. They're appointing people to the first presidency, the you know, Quorum of the Seventy is organized and, and put together. There's bishops and, and you know, things like that. So there's an organizational structure that's starting to emerge in these offices within the priesthood. So the priesthood is, is the thing, really, that Heavenly Father grants to us to utilize his influence in the world to get things accomplished. So when we do things with the priesthood, we can affect supernatural things in a way. We can help people to be healed. We can gain revelation and insights through the priesthood. Uh, you know, we can say things that can and cannot happen in the next life. So the priesthood is an important part of administering the gospel, of helping people to learn and understand more about the gospel uh, and having an organizational structure to keep it, to just uh, to, to, to keep things together, to be organized, to understand who's responsible for what, how does it, all of it work to make sure that it can work in helping more people learn about the gospel. The other thing that's important to realize is the influence or the authority, I should say, to exercise priesthood is something that's not mutually exclusive to an office in the priesthood. And obviously, if you hold an office in the priesthood, you have authority to exercise the priesthood for uh, a stewardship. Okay, so a stewardship is where you have a responsibility to another group of people. And that stewardship gives you, when you have the priesthood authority, you have the authority to do things and, and help the people inside that stewardship. So a husband and a fa a husband and a wife, excuse me, husband and a wife team have authority for the family. A bishop and a Relief Society president have authority for the ward. There's a stake level similar as well, stake president, stake Relief Society president. There's the 70s area authorities, the general authorities, the apostles, first presidency. They all have different levels of stewardship. So this is, and this is an important concept as we understand the priesthood because the priesthood is not about power and influence over other people. The world wants you to believe that that's important, that having power and influence over others is an important thing to achieve. The priesthood is not about that. A lot of people try to see and perceive the priesthood through that worldly lens of power and authority, and it's not. That's an incorrect way to think about it. The priesthood is about service and loving other people. That is important. So it's about helping and loving more people. So the higher your office in the priesthood is, or the higher that calling is that you have, the more people you are to serve and love. So that's really the important perspective to have when you look at the priesthood, is how can you learn 
to love and serve more people as your stewardship increases. There is responsibilities that come with priesthood uh, authority as well that we will be answer questions for in the day of judgment of our you know how we use that authority to do things. Um, a, a major thing that comes up when you talk about the priesthood is women in the priesthood because women aren't given an office in the priesthood. They are not asked to do that. Uh, we should probably do a video just on that alone and go into a little bit more details on some of the ideas that I have around that. Uh, the, the big thing to, to realize though is what is the reason that women do not hold office in the priesthood? It's because God said so. Uh, that's basically it. There's no other reason to, to think about it. It's not like there, you know, there's, it's just, it's God's priesthood and he has said the men are going to hold offices in the priesthood. Uh, and I think that's important because let's face it, if men did not have a structure, an organization or process to help them understand how to serve and love other people, men would not. But let's just face it, that would be a disaster. Uh, and I don't, I, I don't know any guys in, in the church that do not believe that it would be a great idea to give women the priesthood. Everybody's like, oh yeah, if, they, if the prophet came out and said women can hold an office in the priesthood, all the guys would be excited. And I can tell you the number one reason why guys would be excited, because that means the chances of them holding an office like a bishop or stake president or something dramatically goes way down. Because now there's way more qualified people to be in those positions with women having that ability. So if you think about it, really, you know, the biggest reason that men want women to have the priesthood is so that men can be lazier. Uh, that's just... It's guy's nature, unfortunately. It's really sad. But if guys had the choice, they would much rather sit around and watch sports than go help somebody out. And I'm definitely painting very broad strokes on that assumption. Uh, but but the, thing, the thing is to realize is that I think there's a good reason why men, uh, God has given men that priesthood office to force them and make them have to do more to learn how to love and serve people. Women have a natural tendency to do that anyway. So they are, they're natural born leaders in the gospel. And, uh, but they were given other roles that are honestly more important than priesthood roles. That being the role of a mother uh, is supremely important, as the Savior points out in his, some of his teachings in the New Testament. Um, but that does not mean that women cannot exercise priesthood authority. Now, this is an important distinction, because like we talked about, there's holding an office in the priesthood, and then there's exercising priesthood authority. Every woman in the church that has any calling and being a mother and a wife is a calling, exercises priesthood authority, which means she can help and serve the people that she has a stewardship over. She can do things for them. She can pray for them. She can receive revelation for them. She can influence them. And she can't necessarily put hands on a head to give a blessing, but she can pray and ask Heavenly Father to give people a blessing. So that's, the, that's what's so wonderful is they're really... There really isn't much that a guy with the priesthood can do that a woman cannot do, honestly, because they're they're just they're pretty much the same, other than one's holding an office and the other one's not. But other than that, they're they're as far as exercising the priesthood authority is pretty close to the same, uh, with the exception of the, being the judge in Israel for like bishops and stake presidents and things. Uh, that's a very specific priesthood office type of a thing, but most of the substantial things you do in the priesthood, men and women can do, basically through their delegated priesthood authority that they are given. So that's just an important distinction to make, okay, and just realize that. So there's a lot of fun things to learn in here uh, about priesthood and the blessings that the priesthood gives us. Without the priesthood, that opportunity is we cannot receive the ordinances. We cannot have those opportunities to do more. The priesthood does make the LDS church very different from other churches because it opens the door for ordinances. And without the priesthood, the temple is a great place to congregate and to learn more about the gospel, but there's no ordinances without the priesthood. So priesthood is very important and makes a big difference. So a lot of fun things to learn. Uh, in section 106, I do have one note uh, that's in here. So verse 4 and 5 are really good. Again, verse 4, again, very I say unto you, the coming of the Lord draweth nigh, and it overtaketh the world as a thief in the night. Therefore gird up your loins, that you may be the children of light, that and that day shall not overtake you as a thief. This is important. This is a good little tidbit for the last days. When you talk about Latter-day prophecy, here's a little tidbit that's in here, a little nugget for you. 
the world is not going to realize when the second coming happens, when when all that happens and everything gets gets you know culminates in those those uh, events. The world's not going to see it coming. It's going to come, and they're not going to be ready for it. It's just going to catch them off guard completely, like a thief in the night. So in verse 5, it talks about, Gird up your loins, that you may be the children of light, and that they shall not overtake you as a thief. So if we are preparing ourselves, which is girding up your loins, preparing yourself, putting on your armor, putting on your protection, doing things to stand in holy places and help your body to be a holy place for the Spirit to be, if you're in tune with the Spirit and you're keeping those commandments and keeping that Spirit with you, that day will not catch you off guard. You will be prepared for it, be ready for it, and probably have some some revelatory inklings or spiritual promptings to help you in being ready for that and knowing when it's coming. So we don't necessarily need to look at the you know, numerology or other things to understand when is the Savior going to come. The Spirit will help us to know and we will not be caught off guard. So just a little tidbit uh, right there for for understanding Latter-day Prophecy. Now, 107 is huge. There's a ton that's in here. If you want to understand more organizational things for the church, there's a lot here. A lot of good stuff that uh, that can be talked about and brought up in here as well. Uh, in here, let's see, where did it go? Verse 57 is one that uh, I wanted to point out. I got a little note on this one. So section 107, verse 57 it says, these things were all written in the book of Enoch and are to be testified of in due time. So what he's talking about here is realizing that this revelation on priesthood structure, priesthood organization, is not new. They gave it, he gave it to Enoch. It was back there in those days. So this is pre-flood. Okay, Enoch is Noah's great-grandfather. So this is little after Adam has passed away, Adam and Eve have died, Seth has died, Enoch's the prophet, and and really uh, teaching the gospel and doing more, okay? So realize that they had this back then. They had the priesthood authority, same as what we've got today, basically. They had it. They had these opportunities. They had a little bit more of a fullness of the gospel back then as well, if you if you really think about it. That's what they had, and then they've lost it over the years. Uh, so that's an important point to make with that. This is not a modern invention, the priesthood. It is an ancient tradition as well. So a lot of good things there. Also in verse 57, I, I want to point out that says that these things will be testified of that were written in the book of Enoch in due time. Well, we're getting ready because Old Testament is next year in 2022 that uh, we're going to go over the Old Testament because we have some notes about Moses chapter 7, which is one of the chapters. Moses 7 and 8 are the chapters on the book of Enoch. So we have some notes over there that validates what they say here. We do have the book of Enoch today in several ver- several language translations that have pulled together. And you can go read it. And, uh, and I've read it myself. It's a pretty interesting book to read. Uh, So there are some great things that we can learn and realize that there's more coming. There's more things for us to learn and understand that have been revealed to ancient prophets that we don't quite have yet. So a lot of fun stuff with that. Uh, So some fun things there. Uh, And 108 as well. I don't necessarily have any necessarily notes on this one. This one's a little bit more specific to Lyman Sherman. But again, like we talked just a couple weeks ago, while some of these revelations don't seem super exciting to us because they're talking about calling a person in the 1800s to a certain calling in the church, realize that there's a lot we can learn about how did that person prepare? What is this type of calling that they're getting? What's going on with it? Those kinds of things. So we can kind of use their life as a lesson or an example for us to help us in preparing for callings and accepting callings and and, uh, understanding what our responsibilities are. So a lot of fun. Definitely take time to go through section 107. There's a lot of great stuff there to learn.